A motorhome owner destroys a brand new Jeep Wrangler, towing it in four low. Some BLM lands in Nevada are shutting down camping altogether. The Good Sam Club is suing its new rival, the Good Samaritan Club. 7,000 new campsites are set to open in Florida and more. It's time for the latest in RV and camping news. I'm Jason Epperson. This is RV Miles. Here we talk about the latest in RV and camping news that you need to know about. We've got a lot to get to today, but we're going to start with a dramatic story of a couple who hung over a bridge in their truck for over an hour, held up only by their trailer. For 68 minutes, Nikki and Steve Cunningham hung over the edge of the Mallet Gorge Bridge on I-84 near Tuttle, Idaho, watching their belongings drop 80 feet to the solid rock below. The only thing keeping them from certain death? The safety chains connected between the truck and their travel trailer. The couple was on their way to Idaho Falls to get a new awning installed when 35 mile per hour winds pushed their truck off the bridge. After calling 911, a quick thinking truck driver attached stronger chains to keep the truck from falling until emergency crews were able to arrive at the scene. The Cunninghams are local to the area and knew of the dangers of the wind on the bridge, but this time the wind hit them just right, sending them into an uncontrollable sway, throwing their truck over the edge. The couple was able to get out of their truck after a daring rescue by the Magic Valley Paramedic Special Operations Rescue Team, who repelled over the edge, smashed open the passenger side window, and pulled the Cunninghams and their dogs to safety. The Cunninghams were full-time RVers. The trailer was their home, and they've lost everything. If you'd like to help them out, I'll put a link to a GoFundMe set up to support them in the description. The big news in the RV industry right now is growing challenges surrounding the acquisition of supplies, raw materials, and components to build the ever-growing order backlogs. Executives at all the RV manufacturers are working hard to solve supply chain issues they thought would be well behind them by now. Fiberglass, lumber, awnings, glue, and tubular steel are all in short supply and rising dramatically in cost, along with foam for RV furniture, seat cushions, valances, and bedding. It's mostly an aftershock that continues to permeate from COVID manufacturing shutdowns last year, compounded by the recent Texas freeze-up, which is still affecting glue and foam manufacturers, or really anything made from petrochemicals. RVs are made largely out of components, and if one thing, like an RV air conditioner, is unavailable, that RV can't ship. Right now, it's 14 things at once, and it's keeping manufacturers from building to the incredible demand that seems to be even stronger than it was last year. Most RV manufacturers have increased their invoice pricing to dealers from anywhere between 2% and 10%. Supply chain challenges were compounded for Forest River, who suffered a total loss fire at one of its lamination facilities that made components for R-Pod trailers. Other Forest River lamination facilities should be able to pick up the slack for R-Pod, and I hear orders shouldn't be affected too much. Now, if manufacturers can solve the supply chain issues, the RV industry is poised to sell more RVs this year than ever, at a time when those who already own them are using them a whole lot more. Campsite availability is a major challenge for folks wanting to get out to a campground, especially during busy periods in popular RV destinations. Florida is certainly one of those top three states that RVers head to, especially during the winter months. And if you've tried to book a site there recently, well, you know it's a challenge, but help is on the way. More than 7,000 new RV sites will come online in Florida this year and next, between the construction of several new parks and the expansion of existing parks. 5,000 new RV sites at 19 new Florida RV parks and resorts have already opened since December. I have a full list of the new and expanding parks on the RV Miles website. This episode is sponsored by the Togo RV app. If you're looking for route navigation on your phone that takes into account the length and height of your RV, look no further than the Togo RV app, which also includes checklists, maintenance reminders, and recall alerts for your specific RV and a whole lot more. The app's free, but a $39 per year Togo RV Plus membership gives you full access to the navigation features, plus my favorite trip planning software, Road Trippers Plus. You can get $10 off with the code in the description below. The Bureau of Land Management is closing sections of public land near Reno, Nevada to overnight camping because people are violating the 14-day camping limit. 
areas of Golden and Sun Valleys near Chimney Drive and an area off State Route 50 will be closed starting April 1st, the Reno Gazette Journal reports. The locations will remain open for day use and hiking, but both of these areas have more people living in unofficial camps for extended periods. Under the agency's policy, campers can only stay on undeveloped public lands for 14 consecutive days within a 28-day period. There's a ton of BLM land in Nevada, but these areas are particularly a problem due to their access to nearby businesses for groceries and supplies. Compounding the problem is an increase in RV parks in the area who have RV age limits for long-term renters. Trash and abandoned vehicle removal are costing taxpayer dollars, and the agency says it doesn't have the manpower to monitor and enforce the 14-day limit. So it's closing camping altogether, saying more closures in the area could be coming soon. Boondockers Welcome, the subscription service that pairs RVers up with landowners for free camping on private property, has launched a mobile app that allows you to search all their 2,700 hosts, filter based on your RV size, amenities, and dates. You can message hosts and request dates, leave reviews, and save your favorite locations. Earlier this year, Boondockers Welcome introduced insurance protection for its hosts. It's a great service that we've used on many occasions for free overnight parking. You should check it out in the description below. Camping World's Good Sam Club is taking legal aim at a new social network for RVers dubbed the Good Samaritan Club. Run by RV entrepreneur and dealership owner Gigi Stetler under her RV advisor brand, the name is a not-so-thinly-veiled jab at Camping World Holdings and its CEO Marcus Limonis, whom Stetler has had an adversarial relationship with since the 2009 incident in which Stetler says Camping World conspired with an equestrian festival to damage her business, now known as Planet RV in Davie, Florida. Settler has been an outspoken critic in the years since of both Camping World and Limonis, issuing many press releases documenting her legal battles with them. In 2020, she went as far as establishing the website victimsofmarcuslimonis.com to collect stories from people who have had negative experiences at Camping World businesses and with Limonis himself as a part of his CNBC series, The Prophet. In a press release, Good Sam, a subsidiary of Camping World, announced it has filed a lawsuit against RV Advisor and Stetler, claiming trademark infringement over the use of the name Good Samaritan Club. The Good Sam Club was founded in 1966, and though it originally began as a support network for RVers with rallies and community, it's morphed into a subscription service since becoming a part of Camping World in 1997, offering discounts on campgrounds and fuel, roadside assistance, insurance, and extended warranties. Stetler's Good Samaritan Club, which made its soft launch on March 10th, is described as a Facebook-like platform for the RV community, which has profiles, chats, events, and more. It's under Stetler's RV Advisor umbrella, which is also a subscription service offering discounts to campgrounds, roadside assistance, RV insurance, extended warranties, and more. In fact, her RV Advisor website advertises its extended warranties specifically to people who have bought RVs from Camping World. In an email to me, Stetler said that Marcus Limonis cannot trademark the long history of Good Samaritans and the will of the RV community to do good for others. She added that Limonis' time would be better utilized actually servicing the needs of the thousands of Camping World customers who have been sold subpar products and services, handling the barrage of lawsuits from former customers, businesses, partners, and employees and actually helping the struggling businesses featured on The Profit. And I'm still quoting here. Many of whom accuse the CNBC star of unethical business practices, predatory behavior, and intimidation tactics. This is a long and dramatic story that's been going on for more than a decade. I'm not taking sides, but I'm gonna to try to put it all together in a future episode. Stay tuned for that. Speaking of Camping World, the nation's largest RV dealer has continued its dramatic expansion, announcing its acquisition of 10 different dealership locations across the U.S. in just the past month, along with the purchase of land for new dealerships in several states. Camping World's growth is something to really keep your eye on, as the larger they are, the more they can throw their weight around with RV manufacturers and suppliers. There are now around 180 Camping World dealerships in the United States. Camping World isn't the only dealership chain expanding. According to an article in RV Business, Texas's Funtown RV is in the midst of building three new stores and a service center, which will have Funtown operating 14 locations in the Lone Star State. Owners intend to open two more service centers soon after already opening one last year. Service has been a major issue in recent years for RV owners, and the problem is only growing. Funtown may soon be one of the best places to get your RV serviced in the middle of the country. 
The 10 year old company has also recently opened a centralized call center and headquarters, having doubled in size over the past two years. Funtown may be one of the few businesses in the RV industry that actually benefited from the Texas cold snap. According to the article, their sales spiked as Texas homeowners were forced into massive remodeling and repair projects, living RVs in the short term. You can find the full article in the description. Finally, if you're flat towing a vehicle behind your motorhome, it's important to make sure you've completed all the steps to keep it from destroying itself. A motorhome owner learned that lesson the hard way when they accidentally towed their 2021 Jeep Wrangler in four-wheel drive low in first gear. After getting up to probably 50,000 RPMs, the entire underside of the engine blew out, exposing the cylinders from beneath and destroying the transmission bell housing and more. The estimated damage? $30,000 in parts alone. That's it for this video. Make sure to hit the like button if you got something out of it and hit subscribe and the notification bell if you want to be notified every time we release a new one. Let's wrap this episode up with some comments from our last news video. The proposed California diesel law is very concerning. Holding vehicles registered to rules in a different state than registered flies against free trade. Not sure attacking people driving diesel campers is worth the litigation and negative press this will get. I'm hoping and I'm thinking that the law will end up excluding privately owned motorhomes, but we'll see what happens and I'll keep you posted. I'm curious how long until Starlink is really available for the common RV family. I think as soon as this FCC approval goes through that they will be releasing Starlink for mobile customers. The question is, will it be good enough for you to use in a mobile fashion? Probably not for most of us. I'd say it might be available next summer, but it might not be a good option for another year. I pull a trailer with a diesel truck, a Ford. Will it come under the California restrictions? It's only vehicles that are 14,000 pounds or more. It's the actual vehicle, so it has to be a motorhome, unless you've got a pickup truck that's 14,000 pounds. When will the manufacturers realize there's a market for travel trailers that are a little bit more upscale? Airstreams are top of the price category, but there's niche in there that has little competition. What are your thoughts on this, or do you think it's really just a weight factor? I think that's a big part of it. Once you weigh a certain amount, it just makes more sense to build it as a fifth wheel. But I think you're right. Um, and I think especially the smaller travel trailers, you know, Lance is a good brand to check out for this. Lance makes some quality, quality, smaller travel trailers. And I would like to see more of them. I would like to see more smaller travel trailers have some of the features that they put into motorhomes and fifth wheels as well. Your show is 10 times better than the RV show USA. I'm just going to leave that there. The emissions law likely clashes with federal reciprocity laws. For example, window tint over a certain percentage is illegal in some states. I actually don't think it's federal re reciprocity laws. I think reciprocity is, and I may be wrong on this, but I'm fairly certain that reciprocity of laws between states like driver's licenses and window tints and all that sort of stuff is done through agreements between the states, not laws. So you actually can get tickets in some states for having window tint, for instance, that is deeper than they allow, even if you're registered in another state. So I don't think that will actually affect this California diesel emissions law, but we'll see what happens. That's it for this video. Leave a comment below and I'll try to get to it on the next one.